Amen. All right, if you um, have got your Bible today, we're going to Isaiah 53, 52 and 53. And if you're a note taker, um, we're going to Isaiah 52 and 53. And if you're not a note taker, you need to start today, amen? Um, yeah, it's a good process. Um, helps you remember, helps you enter in a little bit more deeply when you take notes along with us. Um, thank you for praying with me. Um, it's an important moment. Um, while you're getting ready, I'll just tell you a little bit of a um, story for how we got here. Um, Christmas Day, several things happened for me. Um, uh, the first thing I'll, I'll, I'll begin with is that uh, I unwrapped a few gifts. Did you unwrap some gifts? Um, Merry Christmas. Hopefully you unwrapped a few. Um, I unwrapped some gifts, and one of those gifts was from my son, Jake, and um, if you know Jake, he's a musical guy, and he likes to write songs as well. And um, about a year or so ago, um, he sent this random text to Linda and I and said, hey, I wrote a song um, about you. And uh, thankfully, there were no lyrics, amen? Uh, but it was just an instrumental piano song, and it was beautiful and really moving, and, and it really gripped us that that uh, he would do this, and, um, and it just seemed, I, I don't know how it's possible, but it just seemed that, that music captured so much that was between us, um, even for decades now, and, and uh, very, very touching. So um, anyway, that was over a year ago, and then I went to unwrap his gift on uh, Christmas morning, and um, he had taken that, he had created sheet music for the song, he had printed it out, and he had framed it for me. And um, you ever get a gift where you just kind of, it takes you a while to fully understand what just happened and, and minutes go by and you're not even really reacting. He, I don't know if he thought I was disappointed or what. I didn't say much. Um, but after several minutes had gone by, I just started to realize um, what this was. And uh, it, I had no breath left in my lungs, if, if you've ever had that experience. Um, and I realized this was a great gift and that I would cherish it till the day I die. Um, big, big deal. Um, there are some gifts that you get that are that way. Um, there's a, there's a gratitude that comes over you. Uh, to be honest, um, I feel almost overblessed as a person. Um, I feel like God has spoiled me with too much, um, and he just needs to move on to somebody else, pour out his love on somebody else, because I've had plenty, and I don't mean any of that, but I'm just saying <laughs> that's how it feels, just a little bit, because <laughs> there's just so much, and I'm so grateful, and I'm so satisfied. I'm so satisfied with what he's given. Um, so that morning, I was looking for a passage of scripture to read, and I was looking for a Christmas passage that would be unique and that would be fresh because, um, you know, sometimes you read the, the, the Christmas passages and, and you can just kind of go into an autopilot mode uh, in your brain and, and they, don't, uh, they don't impact you. And so I was looking for something and, and um, I found Isaiah 53. And I read through it, and, and as I did, it just, it hit me fresh. And, and I felt like the Lord came in and said, this isn't just for you today. I want you to study this all week and give this to the congregation on Sunday. And so uh, you're going to get this today. Um, and I believe that the point of walking through Isaiah 53 is that we would hit together a spirit of thankfulness, a spirit of gratitude where there's no air left in our lungs, if that makes sense. Um, there's no air left in our lungs. A, a thankfulness like that. And, and whenever, when you say that, it, it seems like a tall order, maybe even a little bit intimidating because you're like, you know, this whole being thankful for Jesus thing and what he's done for me, like I, I've taken communion a, a few hundred times, maybe a few thousand times. And every time I know I'm supposed to emotionally enter in to what Jesus did for me on the cross. And when I do enter into what he did for me on the cross, sometimes it feels like an old and tired idea. And I know we're not supposed to say that in church. 
But it's part of the human condition. Repetition just kind of gets us into that kind of a place. And, and we know it's wrong. We know that we're supposed to generate emotion when we think about Jesus. And sometimes we find that difficult to do. And, and can I just say the grace of God is big enough for that? Uh, it's big enough for us, even when our feelings don't match the theology. He's big enough. Um, but what we're going to do today as we go through um, Isaiah 53 is we're going to try to remember Jesus in such a way that he smacks you in the face over again. Uh, and maybe you can start to believe that this can happen over and over again, a resurrecting love that you can have for God that it can keep resurrecting between now and the end of your life, right? Never gets old. So we're going to go to Isaiah, Isaiah 53. Um, Isaiah was written in 700, uh, probably 700, 750 BC, uh, 750 years before Christ. We're going to look at a prophecy by this Old Testament prophet. And uh, man, there's a whole lot to it. Um, this is an epic poem. It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Uh, some scholars call this the suffering servant song. Um, this is a song about someone that God the Father keeps calling his servant. His servant will come and do these things. And when he does, he's, he's telling us about what Jesus would do. And so I'm going to walk us through this. And we don't often do Old Testament prophecy here on Sunday mornings. Um, and this one, um, I just think is so powerful. And, um, but as I do, this is going to feel a little bit more Bible study, a little bit less Sunday morning message to some of you, because I'm going to assume uh, some advanced stuff on you today. So hopefully you slept well last night and you've had your coffee and you are alert because um, there's some things that I want to bring out and I'm going to do it relatively quickly. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm just going to share some advanced stuff. And if, if some of it's over your head and, and you don't understand what I mean, just pass it right by. It's okay. There's going to be plenty in here for you to get, um, this epic poem about Jesus in the old Testament. It's also what I consider to be maybe the saddest chapter in all of the Bible. Some have called this, uh, the torture chamber of the rabbis. Um, that's a weird statement, right? Because this so clearly describes in such detail the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that for a Jewish person who does not want to believe he's the true Messiah, this is bothersome to them. Uh, Augustine, early church father, called this not a prophecy, it is a gospel, he said. And Martin Luther said of this chapter, every Christian ought to be able to repeat it by heart. So there's a New Year's resolution for you. Go and memorize it. Okay. Verse 13 of chapter 52. Some of you are like, I thought you said 53. I'm starting in 52 um, because I believe that's where the song starts. Um, I've talked about this before. Uh, the scripture itself is inspired by God perfectly, um, but the chapter breaks and the, the verse breaks are not inspired. Okay, so people came along later and they tried to give us addresses so that we could quickly find passages. God bless them, amen? Um, but they didn't get it right every single time. So this chapter break, I believe, is in the wrong place. So we're going to start in chapter 52, verse 13. He says, and this is the voice of God, by the way, and he's going to introduce this whole concept of what the suffering servant's going to do. He says, behold, my servant shall act wisely, he shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. God's going to summarize everything that the servant is going to do. And he's going to say at the end, he's going to do it right. And I'm going to exalt him. And some of you guys remember that when Jesus said it is finished, he was given the name that is above every name. As many were astonished at you, verse 14, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So he, he, he says, my servant, that's his title. That's why we call this the suffering servant song. Um, and then he says, his appearance is so marred. What he's talking about there is he's, he's been physically brutalized. 
He's been tortured. He's been brutalized. He's been killed. I'm not going to be grotesque about it. But it says that it is so severe. What happened to Jesus is going to be so severe that you won't even be able to recognize him as a human being anymore. And some of you guys have seen movies like Passion of the Christ. And you get to the end of it and you start to wonder, is this over-the-top violence? He looks so terrible in this. Is this over-the-top? I don't know that it is. Um, It was so bad what happened to Jesus. So I'll give us a statement, and I'm going to do this to to keep us engaged and and to give us kind of a rhythm as we walk through this passage together. But I'm going to say the words for us, and then I'm going to tell you what Jesus did for us, because he is our gift. Amen? So I'm going to say for us, I'm going to tell you what he gave us, and then you guys will say at the end, for us. Some of you guys came from church traditions where you repeated words together. We're going to do it just a little bit. You're welcome. For us... He was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. You would say, for us. For us. That's the first one. Then verse 15, still in 52. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. It says the word so, so in this way. What What it's doing is it's attaching to the previous statement. So therefore, because he was so brutalized that we couldn't even recognize him anymore, he endured so much violence, so he sprinkled many nations. Now, what's the sprinkling all about? That's, that's weird words, right? Like for a Jewish person, it wasn't weird at all. As soon as he said sprinkle many nations, they would have known what that meant. Because in the old Jewish law, the sacrificial system, they would sacrifice an innocent animal. And they would take its blood and they would sprinkle people or they would sprinkle different elements of worship. And the the picture was we're taking something that is sinful and guilty and we are making it now holy through the sprinkling of blood. We're making it clean what was once dirty. So it's saying that Jesus will come and he will sprinkle many nations with his own blood. This is deep stuff, amen? Are you ready for this? You awake now? Right? This is lots going on. Okay. Um, he'll sprinkle many nations. Um, next verse one of chapter 53. The song is going to change. Again, first I told you this, is, this was started with God the Father was speaking about what was going to happen. Now the tone of voice and the perspective of the voice changes. I told you this was advanced. The picture is about to change to a group of people who are in the future who rejected the Messiah. This group of people in the future who are looking back and they rejected the Messiah. So is your head spinning yet? So this is a prophecy talking about a group of people in the future and giving them a song to sing about how they rejected the Messiah and how they regret it. Okay, verse one. Who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, that's Jesus, grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Do you see what they're saying? They're saying, we didn't believe. We didn't get it. He didn't come in such a way that we expected or that we even considered beautiful. And it says, we, we didn't get that the arm of the Lord was before us. That's a picture of the strength and the power of God. Whenever the arm of the Lord is talked about in scripture, it's a sign of his strength. And I love the poetry here. It's saying the arm of the Lord was before people, but all they saw was weakness. The beauty of God was before people and all they saw was ugliness. And says he'll appear weak. It's a root out of dry ground. I want you to imagine just real quickly in your mind's eye, walking up to a piece of ground, Oklahoma, this happens, right? Where it gets so, so hot and so dry that the ground begins to crack. And if you saw a root that was growing out of that cracked, dry ground, you would not expect that root to live, yes? It's a picture of weakness. 
He's saying he's a, he appears weak. And then he says, no form, no majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He's being very thorough here. So he's saying no form. He's not physically fit. At least he's not an athlete. He's got no majesty. That means the intellectuals are not respecting him. Those who would respect royalty, maybe, are not respecting him. And then he's got no beauty that we should desire him. He's got nothing on the outside appearance at all that would make him an influencer today. Yes? Instead, I'm not saying he's ugly. He just doesn't have anything that would automatically, in his exterior, draw people to himself. Sometimes you see Jesus movies or Jesus TV shows, and they hire a male model to be Jesus, right? And you're like, that's so great to hear the words of God spoken by a male model through the screen to me, right? We're drawn. That's just, it's just part of our experience. And I'm not saying they're wrong for it. I don't hate them for it. I'm just saying that if you saw the Messiah in physical form in front of you, you would not be drawn to him. Isaiah is making it very clear. So for us, he came with no majesty or beauty for us. Third or fourth time, you'll get it. Verse three, he was despised and he was rejected by men. A man of sorrows. We just sang man of sorrows. We're going to sing it again at the end. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. As one whom men hide their faces from. Again, another interesting poetic picture. I was reading a commentator trying to describe what this might be like. And this is a, this is a cold and brutal thought. But if you were walking down the street and someone else was walking toward you and they were disfigured or they were somebody that for whatever reason you did not want to look at or you were afraid that if you looked at them and they saw the look on your face when you looked at them, you would be ashamed of your reaction you would naturally turn your face away from them as you walked past, yes? It's a, again, it's a weird thought, but what he's saying is he's so rejected, so disrespected, so hated. This is the way that Jesus came. Have you ever been hated before? I have. Let your thought go there for a second. Have you been hated You've had moments where people didn't like you, where people disagreed with you, sure. But then you have one of these unique moments in life where you realize that another breathing person actually hates you. And that's different. And when you feel that, if you're like me, what, what rises up immediately is the injustice of it all. When you know that you've been hated you immediately start, start to think to yourself, but what about all the kindness I've done toward this person? What about all the ways that I've shown love toward this person? How could they hate me if I've treated them this way? And if you've had that experience, I just want you to know Jesus had it for real because he was hated. And the truth is that little speech that we make to ourselves in our mind, it's not right. We didn't love them the way that we should have. None of us are perfect. Can I get a better amen? amen? None of us are perfect. He's the only one. So for him to be hated, it's going to a whole other level. So for us, he was hated. For us, he was hated. Verse four, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. So just a couple things here. He bore our griefs. It's the, it's the picture of somebody carrying. He carried our griefs. So he interceded truly. He didn't just let us feel it. He felt it with us. All of our griefs, all of our sorrows, all of our sins, we're going to get into the next verses. It's going to talk about every act of rebellion we've ever done, every white lie we've ever told. Jesus was caused to carry it all. And while he's carrying it all on the cross, of course, while he's carrying it all, it says, as we look back, we thought he had been smitten by God. 
We thought he had been rejected by God. We thought the cross, we thought all his suffering was something that he deserved. We regret it now, but that's, that's what we thought was going on. So he's on the cross and he's dying and he's suffering for all of us. Everybody there thought he deserved it. <coughs> Big deal. But he was pierced for our transgressions, verse five. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds were healed. The things to notice there, he was pierced. That's a prophecy about crucifixion. A lot of different ways that the Messiah could have died, but it was crucifixion. And 750 years or so before that, Isaiah prophesied it. He would be pierced in the hands and in the side. That's how he would die for his people. And he was crushed for our iniquities, the chastisement, that's the punishment. The punishment that brought us peace, he was caused to walk through. So there was a punishment that was due for all the things that we have done in this life. And all of that was put on to Jesus. He was asked to suffer all of our collective punishments together. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Amen. Three hours of darkness on the cross. How in the world did he carry all that? The only uh, satisfying, which isn't even satisfying answer I've ever been given is that he was an infinite being and he was able to infinitely pay for us. And you're like, well, that's more mysterious than the question was. I know. But he did it and he carried all of our punishments in himself. The, the theologians call this concept substitutionary atonement. Say substitutionary atonement. You're like, it's not even lunchtime yet. We're saying, what? Substitutionary atonement. So here's the idea. So atonement is someone has to pay. There's a debt, you gotta pay it. Atonement. Substitutionary is you don't pay it yourself. Someone comes in as your sub and pays it for you. Amen. And this is the idea. And, and this idea is showing up in the Old Testament. They didn't even know what substitutionary atonement was. It's taken us centuries to figure it out as a church, but it's being prophesied here. Somebody else had to carry our punishments for us so that we could be righteous. So for us, he carried all of our punishment on his back. He healed our deepest wounds for us. You're getting it now. So that substitutionary atonement, it solves a riddle. And I'm just going to spend a minute on this riddle that it solves. There's an Old Testament riddle that's spoken to Moses. There's this moment where Moses goes to God. You might remember the scene. He goes to God and says, I want to see your glory. And God says, you can't see my glory. It would burn you to a cinder if you saw my glory. And so God takes Moses and he sticks him in the cleft of a rock in the side of a mountain. And he says, I'll pass by. And then you can get just a little bit of who I am. And as he walks by Moses, God says these words. This is Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed in front of Moses calling out, Yahweh the Lord. This is God declaring who he is to Moses. Yahweh the Lord, the Lord of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. That's the first part of the riddle. Amen. God forgives. But second part, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. How in the world does that work, God? He says, I love humanity and I forgive, but I do not excuse the guilty. You know what the problem with that is? We are all guilty. Amen. <laughs> so how does that work? Because the thing is, we love the first part. Like, God, give me that first part. I need that first part. And, and by the way, not only do I need the first part, but I'd really like the first part to be like, you wave a magic wand and all my sins go away. And like a grandpa in heaven, you just kind of wink down at me, say, it's okay. It's okay. That's, that's what we want that first part to look like and feel like. He's like, but I do not excuse the guilty. Well, what's that? That's justice. What in the world do we do with that? And, and some of us, we might convince ourselves for about five seconds that we're, we're not so much about justice, but yeah, we are. 
Because as soon as somebody betrays you, as soon as somebody steals from you, right? Like, where are the police at? Let's get, let's get the justice in here, right? And especially if it goes to violence, especially if it goes to child abuse, especially if it goes to rape, especially if it goes to atrocities. Like, we're like, there needs to be justice. And if there's not justice, then I don't have a just God. And so we want justice for sure. We want to cancel. We want to not trust. And we want people to go to jail. Problem is that same impulse in us puts us in jail as well. Amen. Amen. So what in the world does he do? The solution to the great riddle is that God comes into sinful humanity and he pays our punishment for us. He satisfies justice himself with his own death, the death that you should have died. He dies instead as an innocent person. It's the only way that it could possibly work. The only answer is Jesus. And this is a unique answer, by the way. And I'm going to use the the word unique. None of the other world religions have this solution to this problem. It's absolutely unique. And when I say that, I am not being conceited, egotistical, prideful, anything, because it's not my answer. It's God's answer. Okay, it's not associated with me. I am not somehow superior to the other religions. That's not what I'm saying. And I know I'm making this point probably a little bit too big here, but please hear me. You will not find this path to God anywhere else. The other religions will give you a way that you can achieve your peace back to God. You can earn it yourself by taking a series of steps. Christianity is not that. Christianity is God came down and took your punishment for you. That's how he loves you. Okay, back to Isaiah 53, verse six. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's just so much jammed into these verses. All we like sheep. If you were here when we did Psalm 23 and we walked through that, we really made the point to you guys that we are the sheep, right? We are the sheep. And it's not, it's not, um, it's not a positive um, attribute for us. Um, we are the sheep. And, and, and the way that it describes it here is we've all gone astray. We've all left the path of God. And we haven't just left the path of God because we didn't like his path. We left the path of God because we wanted our own path. Do you see that there? It's right there in the book. We all like our own way best. Anybody? Come on. And so we leave God's way and the Lord laid on him. It just keeps saying it over and over again, like this, like this big, massive burden. God laid on Jesus. The Father laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all, all our sins, all of our guilt. God the Father, when Jesus was there on the cross dying, God literally laid it on him. That's what the cross is for Christians. And you're like, why did the disciples run when he was dying? Hadn't they read Isaiah? Didn't they know this? We wouldn't have known either. We wouldn't have got, they didn't know. It wasn't until later that they came back to this passage and understood it. So for us, the the father placed the guilt of all people on Jesus' shoulders. For us, for us. Verse seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. This is a different part of the whole picture. He opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Uh, This is is just this really interesting picture. Uh, He describes it poetically there, this idea that um, often when someone has sheep and they go to shear the sheep, the wool that it grows is so heavy, it often wants to be sheared. And so it grows so used to just quietly walking to the person who shears it because it's a pleasant experience that if you talk to farmers who have sheep, you lead a sheep to its slaughter and often it'll just go. And so he looks at that picture poetically and says, when Jesus went through the whole Passion Week where he was dying, he was silent as well in just the same way. 
And you see that borne out in the Gospels. When Jesus was taken and arrested and he was uh, taken to his trial, they had a mock trial for him in the middle of the night at the high priest's house. All that was illegal, by the way. It was against the Jewish law that they would do that. And they brought false witnesses against him. And the whole time, Jesus stood there quietly and just let it happen. Why? Because he knew he was sent by God the Father to do this for us. And so he sat there silently and he allowed it to happen. Even when he goes before Pilate, he says nothing. It's only when he's asked a direct question, but he doesn't try to save himself. Do you think he could have unpacked a legal case for himself? Do you think he could have opened up for them? This is exactly why everybody's doing this to me. These are all the agendas. These are all the laws that are being broken. You need to set me free right now. He would have been compelling. But he said nothing. He just let it happen. And it's, it's more than just like fulfilling the mission, guys. It's more than that. It's allowing them to accuse him of such things and not once verbally answering it. He doesn't call out the liars. He doesn't call out those that are being violent against him. He doesn't yell at the Roman soldiers beneath him. He doesn't slander anybody. The quiet lamb of God. For us, he suffered silently, not defending himself and not accusing. For us, for us. Verse eight, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? Two important things here. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. That's a reference to the trial that would happen. There would be an official judgment of guilt made on him. But also it talks about his generation there. He says his generation is going to be cut off. So he's talking about the physical descendants of Jesus. And as many of you know, Jesus never had a wife and family and never any physical children, never any grandchildren. So he was cut off from the land of the living. So we can't speak about his generations after him. Verse nine, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit found in his mouth. Now, that's, that's a weird statement. His grave was with the wicked, number one, and it was also with a rich man that doesn't go together. What a weird prophecy, Isaiah. Which is it? Is it with the wicked or is it with a rich person? It's both, if you know the story. Because he's crucified with criminals on both sides of him. He's crucified and convicted as a criminal himself. What they would have done in Jerusalem after they took the body down from the cross is they would have thrown him in the burn pile outside the city and there would have been no funeral for him at all. That's what should have been done for this wicked man in his grave. It was called Gehenna, was the burn pile outside the city. But no, Joseph of Arimathea comes right at the last minute and says, I've got a brand new tomb and I'm a wealthy person and it's my tomb and I want you to release his body to me so I can honor him in his death. And it's this weird paradoxical moment in the Jesus story. But Isaiah prophesies it. He sees it exactly. And then he says, no deceit was found in his mouth. This is the one moment in the prophecy where Isaiah makes it very clear that the Messiah had never sinned. He had never lied. Not one of you in this room fits that description. No deceit ever found in his mouth. We've all lied. Yes? I'm going to be honest in church. We can try. No violence, no deceit ever found in his mouth. Hebrews 4.14 says that he was, in, he was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. How many times have you found a leader or an influencer or an author or a president or a senator or a, or a coach or, or just a professor or anybody in your life and you respected them so much, maybe even a parent, and you respected them so much, And you're like, finally, at last, I found the one person who won't disappoint me. Come on. And we do, right? And then then we get all excited. And we're like, I want to go get every book they've ever written. 
Because like, I'm so excited. I finally found the person who won't disappoint me. And then they do. Because they always do. Because we always discover at the end of the day that they're human. Jesus is the only exception to that rule. Jesus will never, ever disappoint you. So for us, he lived with every human temptation and he remained perfect and good for us, for us. Verse 10, yet it was his will, yet it was the will of the Lord, sorry to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So it was the will of the Lord to crush him. So b- before we thought he was smitten by God because he deserved it. No, that's not true. But it was God's plan and will to crush him. The father was behind that moment. The father had asked Jesus to walk through that. Some of you know from the book of John, Jesus would say, I don't do anything unless the father tells me to do it. And I don't speak any words unless God the Father has given me those words to speak. He was an absolutely submissive person to God the Father. He was on mission, doing it exactly the way the Father wanted, and he knew it. So this moment, the moment of the cross, was the will of the Father that he would be crushed in that way. His soul makes an offering for our guilt, it says, and then he shall see his offspring. Wait a second, I didn't think we were going to have any offspring, right? Because he was cut off from his generation. Again, it's a, it's a weird little cocktail that Isaiah keeps prophesying here. These are not his physical children. These are his spiritual children. There would be generations, there would be offspring from Jesus, but they would come as his spiritual sons and daughters. If you are a spiritual son or daughter of Jesus today, you are a blessed person, amen? Amen. 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 And then it says, he shall prolong his days. So Isaiah is finally getting to the spot in the prophecy where we're talking about resurrection. So he's been killed up to this point. Isaiah has been clear, but all of a sudden now we're prolonging his days because he's resurrected and he is eternal. So for us, he became an offering to settle our guilt for us. Verse 11, the voice changes again. This is not the people regretting that they've rejected Jesus. This is the voice of the father again. He says, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So there's a whole lot going on there. I love that he will see and be satisfied. It's another picture of resurrection is Jesus comes to the moment where he gets to say, it is finished. And he knows he's done everything God the Father told him to do. And he has rescued humanity, past tense. And he'll be satisfied. That's the gift that he's given to us. And then it says, he's gonna make the many accounted righteous. Don't pass over that. We will be, if we are in Christ, accounted righteous. Why are we accounted righteous? Because something had to be moved into your abysmal account. Because your moral account was in the red massively. And somebody else's righteousness had to be transferred to you. It had to be accounted to you. See, accounted righteousness is righteousness that you haven't earned. And I know it's a lot of academic technical stuff, but do you see? Because of him, you're going to get to be accounted righteous as if you had been clean and pure all your life if you are in Christ. And it says the many, it doesn't say all. Why doesn't it say all? (laughs) Because so much of the prophecy, it was like he died for all, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, well, God gave his son for the whole world, but it's whoever believes in him. You have to choose. You have to say, I want this. This is for me. 
God will not force his forgiveness on you. So many of us come to God and we don't think we've done anything wrong. We come to God, we don't think he's got any right to tell us what to do with our life. We come to God with all kinds of reasons why we don't need necessarily to surrender ourselves to him. And I get it. But it's the ones who surrender that say, this is the gift that I want. And I agree with Jesus that I needed somebody to carry my guilt for me. Many, not all, many will be accounted righteous. It's your choice today. For us, he makes many spiritual children righteous for us. So I've got a summary slide there for you. This is everything he described, Isaiah did, that Christ was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human for us. For us, he came with no majesty or beauty for us. For us, he came to be hated. For us, he carried all our punishment on his back. For us, he healed our deepest wounds. For us, he let the Father place the guilt all on his shoulders. For us, he suffered silently, not defending, not accusing. For us, he lived every human temptation and he remained good and perfect and righteous for us. He became the offering to settle our guilt. And for us, he makes his many spiritual children righteous. For us, for us. The Lord's got to stir the gratitude in us today. We're going to do communion in a minute. And I just want to say, if you're just so kind of fried from the holidays and you're just gonna take the elements and get through it, God's grace is big enough for you, amen? It's okay. But if the word of God today stirred a fresh and a new gratitude in you and you get to offer that to the Lord today, praise God for that. Praise God for that because we need to be reminded, we need to be renewed. If you've never received it, would you stand right now? If you've never reached out to the Lord and say, I agree, I need somebody to take my punishment for me. I don't want to self-atone. I want you to atone for me. If you've never had the opportunity or never taken the opportunity before and maybe God stirred in you and maybe the light bulb came on and, and maybe you're ready today. If you're ready today, can I just walk you through a prayer? Would you bow your heads and shut your eyes?